Imagine randomly throwing a dart at the unit interval of the real line. And consider three simple questions. What is the probability of any specific number being hit? What is the probability that the dart would hit a rational number? And finally, is the probability that it would hit an irrational number the same? In this video, I will show you how the mathematics of measure theory provides a clear answer to all of these questions. It does this by assigning a proper mathematical length or measure to subsets of the real line. Before doing any calculations with measures, I would like to point out an interesting property of the set of rational numbers. That is, they are dense in the real numbers. This means that for any two real numbers you pick, no matter how close they are to each other, you can always find a rational number in between them. In fact, not only can you find one rational number, but there are always an infinite number of them in the interval. And this is true no matter how small the interval is. Moreover, the same is true for irrational numbers. You can always find an infinite number of them inside of any interval of any length. So both the rational numbers and the irrational numbers are dense in the set of real numbers. Keep this in mind as it will help you better appreciate the results we will arrive at by the end of this video. Now in order to calculate the length of a subset on the real line, the key definition we will need is that of a measure. Recall that a measure is a function that assigns a real number between zero and infinity to certain subsets of whatever object we happen to be working with. These subsets form something called a sigma algebra. I made an entire video explaining all of this in detail, and I've linked it below so you can check that out if you're interested. But for this video, all you need to know is that a measure is some function that does this assignment, and it will always do it in such a way that it satisfies a property called countable additivity, which means that the measure of a union of countable sets will always equal the sum of the measure of each of the smaller sets. In our context, a measure will assign a non-negative real number to subsets of the unit interval. First, since the length of the entire interval is 1, mu will assign a 1 to it and will say that the interval has a measure of 1. If we look at smaller subsets, their measures would also be exactly what you expect them to be. Now what about if we selected only the rational numbers in this interval? It's not so obvious how long this set is, right? What could possibly be the measure of a set that consists of infinite discrete parts? There is indeed a clever way to calculate this. Since the rational numbers form a countably infinite set, we can begin by labeling each rational number and writing them down in a list. Here I'm showing just a finite number, but a really nice way to visualize the entire set is with a 2D lattice where each point represents one rational number. Using all the possible p and q values here, would count all non-negative rational numbers. But if we just want the ones between zero and one, we can remove every instance where p is greater than q. Next, for each number in this list, we will draw a small circle around it. We will choose the mathematician's favorite arbitrarily small parameter, epsilon, and draw the first circle with an area of epsilon over 4. It will be clear why we are doing this in a few moments. The next circle will have area epsilon over 8, then followed by epsilon over 16, epsilon over 32, and all subsequent areas will be fixed according to the same pattern. So we've managed to cover all the rational points with these small circles of varying areas. And here's the trick. The values of all these areas form an infinite geometric series. So we can sum them all up and the entire sum converges to epsilon over two. Therefore the summed area or measure of this entire sequence is epsilon over two. This entire argument can be projected onto the real line where we use intervals instead of circles we still arrive at the same conclusion. The measure, which in this case is the length of the sequence, converges. And since every rational number is covered by the set of all these intervals, then the set of rational numbers must have a measure less than epsilon over two. So consequently, it's also less than epsilon. But remember, epsilon was just some arbitrarily small parameter. 
so we can make it as close to zero as we wanted, and still the measure of the rational numbers will be less than this. Therefore, they must have a measure equal to zero. This in itself is quite an interesting result. And in fact, it directly leads to one more. The set of real numbers between zero and one is equal to the union of the set of rational numbers and the set of irrational numbers in the same interval. Now, since the entire interval has a measure of one and the rational numbers have a measure of zero, by the countable additivity property, which remember is just part of the definition of a measure, the irrational numbers in this interval must have a measure equal to one. So although the rationals and the irrationals are both dense in the reals, the rational numbers somehow make up 0% of the real number line. Think about that for a moment. Between any two rational numbers, you can always find an irrational number. And between any two irrational numbers, you can always find a rational. Yet still, the unit interval consists almost entirely of irrational numbers. So now that we know the measure of each of these sets, we can finally answer the three questions we posed at the beginning of the video. First, a single point can always be covered by an interval of any arbitrarily small size. So its measure must be zero. And since the measure of a subset is the same as the probability of a randomly chosen point being in that subset, this means the probability of any particular point being hit is zero. So even though you are guaranteed to hit some point, any particular point has zero probability. This is one of those strange ideas in probability theory that leaves you scratching your head when you first encounter it. Events with probability equal to zero can still actually happen. Second, since the measure of the rationals is zero and the measure of the irrationals is one, the probability of hitting an irrational number is 100%, and the probability of hitting a rational is 0%. So the probability of hitting any particular number in the interval is the same as hitting the entire set of rationals. Both are zero. Interestingly though, since the rational numbers are dense in the reals, you will always be arbitrarily close to a rational number no matter where you land. This seems like a paradox, right? You will always get arbitrarily close to a rational, but you'll hit an irrational 100% of the time. If you're arbitrarily close, why such a discrepancy? Another property sheds light here. Although there will always be an infinite number of rationals and irrationals in any interval, these infinities are not the same. The rationals are countably infinite, which means they can be put into a one-to-one -one correspondence with the natural numbers, while the irrationals are uncountably infinite. This means that no matter how small the distance is between where you land and another rational number, there is an uncountably infinite number of irrationals in between. So both the rationals and the irrationals are spread throughout the entire interval, yet the irrationals somehow occupy way more of it. This really seems to go completely against our intuition, or at least it went against mine when I first learned it. But here's one analogy that I found helpful in trying to think about it intuitively. Suppose you had a bottle with an extremely tiny volume contained in a box with a much larger volume. Inside the bottle is a gas, and outside of it is a vacuum. If the smaller glass broke, then the gas inside would diffuse into the larger space and eventually would be spread out over the entire box. In an analogous way, the rationals exist in the reals like this. Their volume is much, much smaller, in this case zero, but they are spread throughout. It's not a perfect analogy, but it gets you thinking in the right direction.